Well, good morning, church. Hands up who got up late because of the clocks this morning. Okay. Get married. My wife got me up. Amen. There's, there's a discipling right there. <laughs> so, uh, as a result, we started church late. We're not going to have a lead meeting, but we do need your help because we're making videos uh, for the conference, so we need some photos with flags and everything, so that's what we'll be doing afterwards. So we're really going to get it in today. We're going to James chapter 2. We're going to the book of James. And the title of today is Pride and Prejudice. Okay. How prejudiced are you really? Everybody is. Everybody. It's bred into you. It's bred into you to like a certain type of food. It is. It's bred into you to like a certain type of TV program. There is so much that is bred into you by your culture. Especially if you come from a culture where your parents are of the same culture. In other words, they're either both British or both Chinese or something like that. Prejudice is basically a prejudgment. It's forming an opinion before you really know the facts. Think about it. Most people's friends, are they from the same race and color or from different? Most people. Don't get all defensive. Not me. Okay. Most people. The same age. The same nationality. The same social class. See, prejudice is all about, it's not as about, we go color. I don't know. What about people with less education? Do you get annoyed at them? What about older people like me? You just go, they're all grumpy. I don't want to hang out with them. I mean, okay. Nationality. Social class. People like basketball and you like soccer and that's a deal breaker. I mean, there is no place where prejudice is more clearly exposed than in people's love life. Let's just go there. If you're a Chinese student and you came to this country for a few years and you went back with a black African girlfriend or boyfriend, what would that do to you? Yeah, look, some of them go, ah, oh, <laughs> Okay, let's just go there, baby. All right, I've nailed that one. I've heard it, even in the congregation. First of all, that's completely stupid. That's to say you know every single 1.3 billion Chinese people and you don't like them. I mean, that's just ignorance. I mean, it really is ignorance. But what are you actually saying there? You're being racist. Let's just say it. You are being racist. Now, I've had this deep conversation with somebody. But I think what you're actually trying to say is that certain cultures have typically certain characteristics. And that's true. I think Asian people are predominantly harder working than most Europeans. I can say that as a European. Okay. I think Nigerians are, say, not as gentle. Uh, <laughs> As the Filipinos, <laughs> okay. But there is so, okay, so if you're saying that I wouldn't like somebody who is indisciplined, and that is a characteristic of a certain culture, and I, so I'd have to have somebody that was disciplined from that culture. I can understand that. But these whitewashed things where you just go, I, I just don't like those type of people. That's complete and utter ignorance. And it's not godlike. God could have created us all the same. In 1 Samuel 16, 7, it says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. That's what we're meant to do. We're meant to look at people's heart. Not at our age or any of those different things. And this is, it's ne as actually, prejudice is seen more in churches than anywhere else. I mean, it really is. You think about it. If you're in a multicultural city like today, here in Sydney, and you, there is an all-white church, or an all-black church, or an all-Chinese church, that is racist. It is. 
Think about it. Matthew 28, this is the command of God. Verse 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. And sure, I am with you always to the very end of the age. So if you're visiting a church and it's of all one gender or color, etc., one of two things has happened. Either that church is not evangelizing. Okay, in other words, they're not going out and just inviting everybody. Or they're deliberately making a decision to only invite one type of person. So they're either lost because they don't evangelize, they don't love the world, or they're lost because they're racist. Because it's impossible. Lots of us are evangelizing here. And you go out and, you know, just people come towards you. And they don't all sort of line up white on the left and black on the right. It doesn't work like that. You just go, all right, well, there's a myriad of sort of people coming. You just invite people. And invariably, if you just keep inviting people, different types of people will come. So you're either not evangelizing or you are with a set purpose. I remember having a conversation with this guy. He said, I go to an all-Korean church. I go, do you have non-Korean friends? He says, yeah. He said, what do you do when you come to invite them to church? He said, well, I just don't invite them because I know they won't like it. Makes sense. But why would you go to a church? Now, if you're in a country where there's nobody like, I went to Samoa, guess what? All the churches are full of Samoans. Why? Because only Samoans live in Samoa. Pretty much, okay. So there, okay, you get that. But in a, it, it's really, really simple to see from the outside what's really going on on the inside. Point one. Prejudice is the nemesis of selflessness. Prejudice is a nemesis of selflessness. You see, it's easy to get on with people from your own background. It's easier to get on with people of your same age. It's easier to get on with people of your same sex. It truly is. Because, you know, women understand women better and men understand men better. Men grunt and women talk. I mean, it's pretty simple, okay. I want to see, kitchen in the morning, men go in. Mm. Mm. That means, like, pass me the milk. It's like, mm, mm. that's it. That's a conversation in the morning with the brothers. Okay. Sisters are much more, hey, how are you? Okay. James chapter 2, verse 1. My brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Jesus showed no favoritism, nor should we. Who did Jesus associate with? prostitutes, thieves, fishermen, the old, the young, the powerful, the rich, the unseen, and the poor. He fellowship with everybody. Who did he help? The poor, the ill, the weak, the rich, anyone that needed love. When was the last time that you hung out with somebody outside your emotional social circle? Somebody you found difficult to get on with. Maybe somebody that smelt. Somebody that was old and mumbled. Somebody that was, I know, 13, full of emotions. A five-year-old that's just super excited and annoying to you. When was the last time that you denied your feelings to really love somebody else? How many times has there been a homeless person sleeping in those chairs out there and you've walked straight past them? You know, I am really, really loving this evangelizing eight people a day. Because there are some days where you, it's easy, you, you know, we set up and we get evangelism on Monday at university and all that sort of, great. But there are some days that, Kerry and I, we, we've just got back-to-back -back appointments. And so you actually have to force yourself. It's one of those days you could easily not evangelize. Even this morning, I was like, okay, how am I going to invite my eight? Right, I'm going to be outside the church and start inviting people. It was great. The bus driver came off the bus and went, I'm going to go and talk to him. Had a great conversation with a guy that I would never have had a conversation with. Comes off the bus, he must be 50 years old, we talk about belief, I send him an email, etc., etc. It's great because it forces you to actually go and meet people that you normally wouldn't go and see. These challenges are things, they just help to help us what we should be doing anyway. You know, recognizing favoritism. Chapter 2, verse 2. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. 
If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand here or sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? It does us the world of good to go and help the homeless. What do we do it now? But there are too many of us, so we have to sort of do it in little points. But I think sometimes, yeah, we need to build a church and we need to get, uh, convert great leaders. But the purpose of converting great leaders and building in church is so that you can then take those great leaders and help the poor. It's not just to go and convert great leaders so you just convert great leaders and convert great leaders. Great leaders are meant to go and help the poor and less fortunate. So it's great that so many of us are students, but let's not forget why God has given us gifts. He's given us gifts to help the less fortunate. Sometimes we just need to take some time and spend time with the less fortunate. You know, who do you evangelize? Just those people that you relate to? It's been great evangelizing. We did, Kerry and I are doing with this little challenge far, far more uh, evangelism, and she's far better at it than me. She's sweeter. You can uh, Actually, when I evangelize with Kerry, I really realize she's really much sweeter than me. Because I'm like, like, typical man, hey, you want to go to believe in God? And blah, 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 blah. She's like, ah, we were out evangelizing yesterday. Again, we're, full day, okay, we're having a date, need to quick and go out and evangelize and meet some people. And she's there and she's with this girl and I'm standing there just sort of grunting at a few people and trying to have a conversation. She's hi, great, it's great. I thought, I need to learn from my wife. I can be a bit sweeter, you know. Maybe I'll get more people. So um, even on Monday, where was it? Tuesday night, I was inviting people. Met no one. Kerry came and joined me. I met someone. Get married. I'm in. There you go. Right. <laughs> if you want to know how prejudiced you are, who are your best friends? I never thought I was prejudiced. Now, I was brought up in a very, very English household. It was white. My house, parents' house is 600 years old. My auntie, you, some of you know that she's, hello, darling, how are you? That is where I come from. <laughs> when I came to uh, the church, I moved to London, became a Christian. I used to wear tweed suits. I carried my big Bible. I'd wear brown brogues, and I'd walk around. I, I tell you how ignorant I was. I went on a date after I became a Christian with my first black African sister. And on the Saturday night, she had short hair. And on the Sunday at church, her hair had grown eight inches. <laughs> and I went up to her and said, do black people's hair really grow that fast? <laughs> now, you may be laughing at me, but how well do you know the Asian culture? How well do you know the Australian culture? How well do you know the Vietnamese culture? Oh yeah, you can get caught out a few times. You can laugh at me and I'm old and stuff, but what about you? How prejudiced are you? You know, I love the fact that God gives us the different parts of the world. Every single culture has enormous strengths. I love the American culture. The American culture is one of those cultures, if you're cynical and evil like me, you go, they're just too fired up. Do you know what I mean? But Jenna, being an American, has changed the culture of this church. She is somebody who, when she shares good news, she jumps up the front, she's like, here I am. That changed the culture of our church. It did. That, they are generous with their feelings. They are generous in their attitudes. And we need to imitate that part of their culture. You know, I love the Nigerian culture. A bit rough, but, you know, if you want the truth to be spoken, you send in money. I love the Australian culture. What I love about the Australian culture is they will tell you exactly what somebody needs to tell you and not, not have a malice to it. I always say this. An Australian go, mate, you're ugly, but I love you. I mean, that, that's in Australia. It's like, I'm going to tell you the truth, but it doesn't bother me. I mean, just, there's something about, and you just want to go, yeah, I know, and it's okay, right? You know, it's just, there's something about that culture that's like, that's how it is. If you want something done that's going to take long hours, give it to an Asian. They know how to stay up all night and work. They do. They absolutely do. You go to the Hong Kong church, they're like a little army. She, Aaron, these boys know how to work hard. There's something to be imitated. I think just the pure joy of Filipinos. 
I mean, I go there, I make jokes, we were studying with Lance yesterday. I mean, they're security guards. You go to America, and that's the only bit where I sort of feel like they're not friendly. You go to the airport, they've got a gun like, you're coming into America. And then you go out the airport, and everybody's really nice. You go to the Philippines, you're in a mall, they've got a shotgun, and they're like, hi, how are you? <laughs> you're like, it, it, I was so confused, I had to go up to him and go, does that gun actually work? <laughs> and he went, yeah, it does. Okay, all right, just check it. But there is so much great part of every culture that if you don't embrace foreign cultures, it's you that's missing out. It really, really is. You know, going on to James chapter 2, verse 5. Listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to become rich in faith? to inherit the kingdom. He promised those who love him. But you have insulted the poor. It is not the rich who are exploiting you. Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name to him to whom you belong? In so many people's minds, money equals success. Some of us are tempted to miss church because of work. Let's just think this through, okay? If you are dedicated to God, sorry, if you're dedicated to work more than God, and you need a better job, and that's your excuse, why would give God give you a better job? It's your job that you're, that you're worshipping rather than God. It just makes no sense, right? So you actually have to give up your job and go, I'm going to put you first, God, and then he'll give you a job. You think about being devoted to a boss. Does your boss love you? So, if you broke your arm, would your boss visit you in hospital? If you had a marriage fight, would your boss come round and counsel you? If you broke up with your partner, um, girlfriend, boyfriend, would they put their arm around you and, and, and console you? No. So why are you committed to them? They don't love you they use you. That's work, right? I pay you to do a job. Love is not in the equation. But they know that they need to treat you well because if you treat people well, you get a higher performance out of them. But when we put people at work above God, it's just completely illogical. And i tell you why. Because as soon as you resign, their real feelings come out. You know, it's our great joy that we've hired Jesse to go into the ministry. She's in a family, as a, as a uh, looking after children, who claim to be Christians. God has called her to go into the ministry. As soon as she resigned, they turned on her. Started assassinating her character. Because it's inconvenient for them. Now we'll see how people really feel about you. Even the boy, I've been in big business, and when people resign, they often march you off, off, off the job at that moment in time. They go, I don't trust you, so leave now and we'll pay you two weeks' notice. That's the level of love in the world. It's saying here, you know, the rich people, the people with money, why are you committed to them? Why are you so focused? Why are you admiring these people? These aren't the people that love you. In actual fact, when you are loved by the poor, you know it's true love. Why? Because they're not after anything. They're just with you as friends. It's why often we have greater relationships as students. Because, you know, you, you have nothing to gain from another student. Nobody's got any money. The same as Christian. It's like, what do I get from other Christians? Well, we share secondhand clothes. I mean, there's a, new, there's a new fad going on inside the church. We always know that when sisters live together, right? You sort of see this clothes, and on one Sunday, one sister's wearing it, and then one's that. That's normal, right? Okay. But now I look at Manny and Scotty, and I don't know whose clothes are whose, or who stayed over at which. Is Manny becoming Samoan, or what, what's going on? But why are we impressed with riches? Why are we impressed with a job? It's just a job. 2 verse 8. If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you're, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking it all. 
For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a Lord breaker. He's talking about here about, let's just get back to some real basics. Love your neighbor. I'm going to challenge you. I'm not going to ask you to ha- put your hands up. Was there a day that you didn't invite eight people? Why? Well, I didn't have time. Do you live next to somebody? Why didn't you door knock them? You see, we, we sort of, and that's the whole thing. We get into these, these churchisms, in which, well, I evangelize at six o'clock at university. Well, that's good. But what about your next door neighbor? And we can all do it and go, I'm, I've, I feel justified. I've evangelized all day and walked straight past our neighbor. My challenge to you this week is door knock your neighborhood. Especially on a Saturday afternoon, four o'clock. That's a really, really good time. Most people are at home then. But just, you know, before it gets started, just go and see who your neighbor is. Invite them around. Too often we go, I can never get hold of anybody when I follow up. Well, if you invite your neighbor, guess what? Every time you go home, you just knock on the door. Hey, mate, do you want a cup of tea? I mean, that's all you need to do, right? Too many of us are great at getting telephone numbers and terrible at building relationships. Because we've got into a form of evangelism that is legalistic. You know, where is the old time? You just go, come around for a cup of tea. Or visit somebody for a cup of tea. Or whatever drink it is, coffee or juice or whatever any juicing people do these days. Okay, but my point is, is go and hang out with people. Build relationships with people. James 2 verse 12. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Let's talk about what's going on inside our hearts. We all need to act as if we're going to be judged. That is shown mostly in your homes. What's going on in your home? How merciful are you towards other people in your household? When they leave the dishes in the sink, when their washing is still in the washing machine five days later, or whatever it is. If Jesus was standing right next to you, which he is, (laughs) and you saw him, would you act differently? We need to live as if God is watching us all the time, because he is. Hebrews 4.13, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight, Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. We've got to make sure that our lives on the inside are better than the outside. I know we talked about briefly the other week about the concept of godliness versus spirituality. So godliness is like fruit of the spirit, being kind, being gentle, being patient. You can do that while inside really having a lot of bad attitudes. We need to make sure that our heart is clear before God. Because it's really easy to come to church and clap. I'm going to bring up another point. Some of you do not sing to God. What does that say about what's going on on the inside of your heart? that you should be singing to God in your quiet times. You should just be singing to God. It's praising God. If you can't sing at church, where is your relationship with God and other people? The Bible actually says, sing to one another in psalms and hymns. There's a selfishness. I can tell you this. People who do not sing will fall away. It's a basic thing. It's like, if you don't pray, you fall away, right? If you don't give, you fall away. If you can't sing to God as part of your relationship with God, you will fall away. Why? Because you already are very far and distant from God. And I'm not talking about the guy that just got baptized. And if you didn't know, Kayla, where's Kayla? Kayla got baptized on Wednesday at the women's meeting. Come on, come on. If you see somebody not singing, deal with it. Disciple it. Why? Because you love them. Because you know God is going to judge them. Imagine going to somebody's wedding and being moody. How would that person feel? They would not be happy, right? This is God's church. This is where we worship. 
You need to go and have a prayer time to God today and apologize to God for treating him so badly. Point number two, are you proud of what you do? Are you really proud of your life? Shouldn't we all be proud of our life? You know, I love, I meet Manny in the mornings on Sunday and I go, how's your life? I love my life. How's your life? I love your life. Or Jamie goes, I'm living the dream. Every time you meet Jamie, how's life? I'm living the dream. Are you living the dream? Are you living the dream? James 4, 2, 14. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? The answer is no. This whole false doctrine that you only need to believe in God to be saved. That's not true. John 8, 31, to the Jews who have believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You only see great things in your life when you do something. You think about this. How many people do this? How many people are spectators in life? I want to be a great basketball player. Do you play it? No. I want to win the lotto. Do you buy a ticket? No. I mean, it's man's, like, we live in a fantasy world where nothing happens in our life because we think about things, but we don't do anything. I was always told by an old mentor, he goes, some people dream about doing great things and some people stay awake and do great things. It's as simple as that. The question is, is, are you happy about your life? Are you proud of what you do? If you're not, do something about it. There is nothing greater than confessing your sin and dealing with it. Don't you think? I mean, just, okay, I'm not doing well. Can you please talk about it? Because this week, I want to do well. That is one of the greatest gifts that God has ever given us, is confession. Is that every single day of your life as a Christian, you can decide from this moment on, life is going to be great. Most of the world never experience that. They are defined by their past. You know, I was so proud. Ian and Marg have been our friends since almost we were born, I think. Okay. But we've been friends forever. Like, this is a couple that when everybody left our house and said, we don't want to be with you for joining the movement, only Ian and Marg were there. That's it. That's who they are. We went on camping trips with them. We had fun. I mean, we always did love it. We used to have, like, our tent... And then Ian and Margo arrived with the television and the kitchen sink. And like, we're like, they're our camping buddies. I mean, literally, you know, they'd bring a coffee machine. We'd just go down the road and buy a coffee. Okay, I mean, but I mean, we had some really fun times. Um, but I'm very proud of them. There's some things in the Bible that we like to sort of distort. The Bible says, if you want to be fruitful, persevere and you'll be fruitful. I was talking to Margot, and today, with uh, Lynn being baptized, Margot's going to be fruitful for the first time in 23 years. And she was talking a little bit before I said, I sort of feel a bit funny about it. And you know, I, I can get that. But I said to her, I said, it's not how you start, it's how you finish, Margot. Yeah. See, I know many great evangelists 20 years ago, and they ain't around. They ain't around. Yep. Yesterday is irrelevant. Yep. Today is what's relevant. Tomorrow is what is relevant. Look at how well their kids are doing. Yeah. Well, I struggled. Yeah, you did. You're not. Move on. Right. When they go to New Zealand, that's a completely new chapter in their life. Yeah. That's it. We don't talk about what happened in Australia. We don't talk about what we have in England. This, this is our life now. Yeah. This is our mission field. Everything up to this moment in time, we were being prepared for at that moment. Are you proud of where you're at? If not, be like Margot. This is the day I change. Although it happened many months ago, etc. But but I mean, today's the fruit of it. James 2.15. Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about the physical needs, what what good is it? In the same way... Faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. We're meant to help each other. We're very different as a church. We don't view any of our possessions or anything as our own. We're radically different. So let me tell you what's actually going on inside the church. 
Right now, the church is really growing. It's been fantastic. We are here to send out churches to New Zealand and then to China and then to Papua New Guinea, which I didn't realize had twice as many people as New Zealand, amen, um, and to Fiji and all sorts of different places, okay? Mongolia. That means we need to pool our resources. So when I get the opportunity of I hear somebody that could be in the ministry and doing well in the future, but we don't have money to hire them, what do you think I do? I hire them, okay? So... I heard about this girl from Harvard called Fung, who was like, okay, she could be really great in China, let's hire her. And Millie and I look at the budget and go, let's pray, okay. And then when we were at the GLC, we found Nicole, who's from Hong Kong. And Hong Kong needs boostering, so she's moving here on Wednesday. And we don't have the money paid her to pay her, so we pray. And Right now, with building up for New Zealand, this means our houses are going to be a little bit stretched and packed and people sleeping on floors for two or three months. And there's a real potential then to go, mm, well, that means I need to pay rent. And, you know, the way that we can hire Fung is we don't ask her to pay rent. And we're not going to ask Nicole to pay rent because we don't have the money. And that means you're paying rent when somebody else should be. And, but we don't view it like that. We go, we're here to seek and save the lost and save the world. That's it. So if people need to pay rent and somebody else doesn't and they've got the money, that's what we do. Because then what's going to happen is, is everybody's going to go. So we're going to lose 12, 13 people to New Zealand and then we're not going to have enough people in the houses. So we're going to go through a period of where things are a little bit packed. If you are spiritual, you'll get on board and be fired up. Because that will always be the case with us. Because that's what we're here about. We are here to, first of all, send out New Zealand, which are the New, New Zealand banners, and they look pretty cool. Um, and thank you, Fung, for helping with that. So you see, you bring her in and she helps. Okay, great. Then we're going to bring back the guys from Hong Kong to train them up to go out to mainland China. And then once we've sort of set up China and we've set up uh, the islands and Fiji will be planted from New Zealand and so will Samoa, etc. And then we're going to focus on then building up the church to 120, cutting off 40 people and just sending it to Melbourne. That's what we're going to do. And then we're going to really focus on Australia. So next year is almost like the year of China. A lot of the guys on staff will be for China. And then it'll just be plain old down to, hey, who else wants to be in the ministry? Oh, Leslie. Oh, there you are. You're Australian. Well, I think we ought to go in the ministry. And, uh, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then, so we've got to get on board with all of that. But it does mean being a little bit tight right now. It does me going round, saying to a few of you, going, you know what, can you give a little bit more contribution? Is that possible? Can you pay a little rent? Can somebody sleep in your bed and you, maybe you sleep on the floor? Why? That's what Christians do. We help everybody. And that's why we love the church. When we sacrifice and we have no prejudice and we don't declare that we have any rights, that's when we come to church and we go, I'm proud of our church. No sacrifice, no pride. Come on. Yeah. You know, I love the fact that we all love each other. I love the fact, MJ obviously became a Christian, Effie's sister, and um, I love the fact, here's an opportunity, they need to move. I turn around the brothers, Aaron, Chris, let's get a van, let's move them. Who's got stuff? Who's got a fridge? Let's give them that. And we help them move, when you see MJ, she's like, I like my church. <laughs> you can see I do that. It's a good church. They love me, I like it. That's what it's meant to be like. We're meant to feel that love. I think even in the households, teaching people to cook, we went over to a, a man at a Sydney Uni Bible Talk. The food comes on, and you're like, are we in a restaurant? Yeah. And we're like, so who made this salmon? Okay. And everybody looks at Ned and goes, Ned cooks nearly every week. And then Manny proudly declares, when I moved here, I couldn't cook. But Ned has been training me. <laughs> You're like, that's the family. We help each other. We're intertwined. You must rejoice in that fact and embrace that fact. James chapter 2, verse 18. But some will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I'll show your faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God. Good, even demons believe that and shudder. You know, we've got to have no pride in defensive arguments. This is totally one of the things we use with people who go, all I need to do to be saved is have faith in God. 
You know, hold on a second. Demons don't struggle with faith with God. They know there's a God. You don't go up to a demon and go, do you believe God exists? <laughs> no, I haven't got much faith today. <laughs> demon does it. Demon sees the spiritual world. Yeah. What do you mean, do I believe God exists? There he is. Are you doing anything that's godly? No. So you can believe in God, do nothing, and be just on par with a demon. Belief on its own means nothing. Right. Belief in action. You know this in a relationship. You ever get ticked off if someone goes, love you, bro, love you, bro, and you go, it'd be nice if you showed it. <laughs> you, you, you ever had that? You ever had that critical idea? You're like, will you just, why don't you say, I like you? It's a bit more honest than I love you. <laughs> you have you ever had that feeling? I was a bit like, okay, maybe it's just me. Okay. <laughs> Faith without deeds is useless. Righteousness requires action. James 2.20. You foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture that was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. This is a really amazing passage about Abraham. And it explains a lot of actually emotional doctrine that we need to talk about. In Hebrews 11 verse 17, it really gives an indication of what's going on here. It says, By faith Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead, and so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. What's incredible about this is, and I love this passage, it explains so much about faith. God says to Abraham, through Isaac, your offspring will come. Promise. Go kill Isaac. Promise. I don't understand God. And most people get to that point, never get faith and leave God. God's stupid. God's unreasonable. God contradicts himself. What Abraham did when, okay, God never contradicts himself. God is never at fault. The offspring will come through Isaac and I do need to kill him. They're both commands, and they're both things that God have said, so they must both be true. So that means I must kill Isaac. So let me try and figure this out. The only way that the promise is true, and I can obey, is the fact that I must kill Isaac, and he must somehow be able to be resurrected and come to life afterwards. Resurrection was nowhere in the concept of the Bible before. Abraham came up with a brand new concept and went, this must be it. Because I know God doesn't contradict himself. So many of us know what to do in the Bible. But we go, because I can't figure it out, I am not doing it. So you know what? I know I need to come to church instead of go to work. But if I do that, I won't have money to pay my bills. So I'm going to go to work. That's totally wrong. You're not obeying God. You're not allowing God to work. God is perfect. The only, this is what's great about Christianity. You don't even need to understand some of the commands. You just need to obey them. <laughs> Imagine you go, to be a Christian, you need to understand everything. We would be here forever. <laughs> you don't bring up a child like that. Don't put your finger in the electric shock. Into the, into the socket. And your kid at two years old goes, Dad, can you explain to me electricity? <laughs> First of all, I can't explain electricity. <laughs> Just don't do it, okay? But here is we have this, do you really understand God? No. You have always got to look for the hand of God in your life. You know, right now, Beric's mum is studying the Bible in Hawaii. <laughs> 
I think she's doing light and darkness today or tomorrow. So Beric is a student. She'd had some challenges and failed a couple of exams. So that forced her mum to come over and tutor her. Now, I'm not saying you should fail a couple of exams. Okay, that's not what I'm saying. However, you must look for the hand of God in everything. Without that, in other words, God used that to then bring her mum here. We were able to get with her for a bit because we have relationships with people in Hawaii. Roz and Jeremy have connected with her and then started studying the Bible. She's gone over there to look after grandmother and is like, well, I can't come to church because grandma needs me. Well, bring grandma to church. So grandma should be coming to church tomorrow. You see, Beric doesn't know anything but obeying God. She can't figure out her mum and her grandmum and her this and her that. We just need to be obedient. We need to be righteous. So what I love about Christianity, just do what's right. Just do what's right. You're in a household and somebody hurts you, do what's right. You walk past somebody, you know you, you know that bit, you're on a bus, you know you should evangelize somebody, just invite them. You know you should forgive somebody, just forgive them. You're here studying the Bible, you know you need to become a Christian, just do it. I need to understand everything. When? When will you? You never ever will. You get to a point, you go, I've just got to do it. Coming in for a landing, James 2.25. In the same way, not even Rahab the prostitute considered, uh, considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Here he's even going, you know what, let's just talk about Rahab. She was a prostitute. She had a messed up life. Made a decision one day to be righteous, and now we're still talking about her three and a half thousand years later. Doesn't matter what your past is. Doesn't matter what you did yesterday. Doesn't matter what you did last week. All it matters is, is what you do today. That's it. You had a bad week? Make a decision. Start evangelizing. Use the prayer list. Start getting out there. Make a decision. Come to the conference. Get registered quickly. Help everybody with it. Make a decision to become a Christian. That's all you've got to do. You've got to let go of your own prejudice and your own pride. We're even prejudiced towards becoming a Christian, some of us. I could never become a Christian because my friends would think that's wrong. Well, you're prejudiced against Christians. God is the only person that teaches love. True love. He really is. You think about it. Who else has ever uttered these words? Love your enemy. That's the solution to the world right there. That's the solution to the abuse in houses. That's the solution to all sorts of things going on in cities. That's the solution between countries, is just love your enemies. Let go of your pride, forgive. Let go of your prejudices, let go of your nationalism, and embrace God completely. You know, it gives me great pleasure to now ask up on stage another lady who is going to become a Christian, which is Lynn. I've had a few conversations with Lynn. Lynn comes from China, and there have been challenges in in her background. But today she's going, enough. I'm going to let go of it, and I'm going to let God. Amen. Amen.